Welcome to the Asia Climate Finance Podcast, where our host and his guest discuss and evaluate climate business and climate finance issues and trends. Please support us by liking and subscribing to the podcast. Also, please note the disclaimers at the end of the show. Here is your host, investor analyst and author, Joseph Jacobelli. Hello there and welcome to episode 42 of the Asia Climate Finance Podcast. One of the rapidly growing areas in climate business and finance is the purchase by corporations of clean energy. Now, this is frequently referred to as corporate renewable energy procurement. Such purchases jumped 12% to 46 gigawatts in 2023, according to BNEF. Our guest is Suji Kang. She is the program director of Asia Clean Energy Coalition, an organization dedicated to corporate renewable energy procurement in the Asia Pacific region. Members include major multinationals such as Amazon, Google, IKEA, and many others. We discuss a great variety of topics, including the broad picture of what is actually happening on the ground in the region with corporate renewable energy procurement, the work of Suji's organization with governments, and the challenges currently faced. There may be one or two minor glitches with the recording. Apologies for that. But I am sure you will enjoy the conversation and the show. As mentioned earlier, we have Suji Khan from the Asia Clean Energy Coalition joining us uh, from actually Hanoi, from Vietnam. How are you, Suji? How's, how's the weather? How's everything? Thank you, Joseph, and thank you very much for inviting me to this exciting episode. I'm very delighted to be part of the corporate decarbonization conversation today. I'm doing very well. Well, I've been Hanoi exactly for, for one year so far. I love this tropical weather with a lot of opportunities for swimming with my daughter, while I'm also serving my professional duty as program director at the Asia Clean Energy Coalition, where I'm mostly responsible for engaging all members and stakeholders to create a favorable policy and market environment for the company's clean energy procurement across the Asia Pacific region. Right. So be, be, before we get into the, the actual main topic, which is corporate clean energy procurement, could, could you tell us a little bit about what exactly the Asia Clean Energy Coalition is? What's its mission? Who are the members? You know, information like that? Sure, I would love to. And thank you for giving me that opportunity. So the the Asia Clean Energy Coalition, the so-called ASEC, was launched at the COP27 in 2022 November uh, by the Climate Group, the Global Wind Energy Council, and the World Mm -hmm. Energy Resource Institute as a coalition of world-leading renewable energy buyers in Asia in collaboration with the sellers, our mission has been very clear. It is to unlock renewable potential through sophisticated policy engagement and leveraging the collective influence of corporate leaders for scalable procurement of low-carbon electricity in Asia. So we have very, very influential founding members which I'm very proud of, including Amazon, Apple, Cisco, Enel Green Power, Google, Iberdrola, IKEA, Mainstream, Meta, Nike, Orsted, Samsung Electronics, and Semcorp, working all together to achieve our 2030 decarbonization goal. Please allow me to promote a little bit more about the coalition's unique value proposition. I would Mm -hmm. like to emphasize that ASEC operates as the only regional platform in Asia so far, strategically positioned between national and global initiatives. So we're really trying to be collaborative with existing actors that share common interest in the decarbonization agenda by leveraging ongoing efforts and initiatives undertaken by the different organizations. And secondly, We bring a diversified view from the different groups into one platform. So Mm -hmm. like 
We're taking different views from buyer's group, seller's group, and also potentially from financial's group to make sure that these are all well coordinated and mm. make collective voices together for accelerating corporate procurement of renewable electricity in Asia. Okay, that's that's quite a lot to un- unpack. So maybe we'll <laughs> break it down into little bits. The first one, I think maybe some people are not 100% clear on when we're talking about clean energy procurement, what are we talking about here mm. from a corporate perspective? I mean, is it is it, I don't know, a, a company setting up a wind farm and buying mm-hmm. directly from a wind farm? Is it that they are buying credits, you know, carbon credits? I mean, mm-hmm. what, what, mm-hmm. We, what is the context? What's the kind of the general definition or landscape on that? Sure. So I can introduce several renewable energy procurement options most commonly available for corporates. So first, we have power purchase agreements, which is called this. PPAs allow companies to purchase electricity directly from renewable energy producers, uh, usually at a fixed price over a long-term period. And I actually would like to revisit to this mechanism very shortly when I will be addressing some of key challenges in Asia for sure. renewable energy procurement. Um, the next option we have is on-site renewable energy generation. So with this option, corporates can invest in on-site renewable energy installations, such as solar panels on their buildings or wind turbines on company property. And we also have green tariffs. Uh, Some utilities offer green tariffs which are programs allowing companies to buy renewable energy from their utility provider by paying extra on the top of their electricity bill. As next, we have have a renewable energy certificate, so the called RECs. So RECs represent proof that electricity has been generated from renewable energy sources. Uh, wow. Corporates can purchase RECs to offset their energy consumption, ensuring yeah. that the amount of electricity they consume is added to the grid from renewable sources. So, yeah, mm-hmm. these are the four very common options that are available for the corporates so far. Okay. Yeah. PPA, corporate PPAs, uh, on site generation, the green tariffs or the green premium mm-hmm. kind of. Uh, structure mm-hmm. as well as right. the uh, carbon credits, and that's pretty much global, right? So, that's what, right. What, about, um, what about in Asia? Is there many differences in Asia? Is one one kind of mechanism more popular than the other, or easier to implement than the other? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, it's really different by country. I mean, like while in some countries they have less or no options for the procurement. Uh, Mm. Whereas there are some leading countries where all the options are well implemented. Mm, 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 mm. So it's really depending on the country. Because Asia is so so diversified, right? That's Um, right. That's right. I want to talk about a couple of the mechanisms a little bit more. But before we talk about that, could we talk a little bit about the kind of Asia specific, Asia Pacific, Asia mm-hmm. Pacific specific, that's hard to say mm-hmm. very quick, kind of situation. I mean, because I think most people that are familiar with Asia know that, you know, each country's situation is quite different, quite distinct. Mm-hmm. So could you explain a little bit some of those of those differences, perhaps? Sure. So, yeah, we all know that we are at a very, very critical time when large corporates are really ramping up their commitment to reducing emissions in Asia. Mm. Uh, the numbers clearly demonstrate this as the region already accounts for 17% of the renewable electricity procurement of Climate Group's RE100 initiative. And out of their 400 members since 2021, 58% of all new members have been headquartered in Asia Pacific. So we we have numbers there, but there are still 
bottlenecks existing primarily because of the four reasons. First, there are limited options for purchasing renew renewable energy. Second, we have limited availability of renewable energy. Third, we have a high cost issue caused by mismatch between demand and supply. So demand already overruns the limited supply at the moment. And lastly, we have a very high level of regulatory complexity given nature of its own market structure. And furthermore, it is very interesting to note that uh, studies uh, also revealed that under ASEAN countries' current policy settings, solar and wind share of the power, power mix will only scale up to 11% by 2030, while companies in Asia are facing to greater demands from consumers and suppliers to meet the decarbonization goals. So it really clearly shows that there is an urgent need to support governments and other stakeholders to meet large and growing demand for corporate clean energy procurement in Asia. And this is exact and core background why the ASEC has been formed. Obviously. And I guess we can go back to some of the bottlenecks of some of the kind of country by country um, mm -hmm. the differences in, in, in the regional and how ASAC is actually working in these countries. But as mentioned earlier, could we talk a little bit more about the corporate PPAs? Because I think right. on-site generation is pretty is pretty straightforward. Paying a premium for electricity mm -hmm. that you buy because the electricity is green. Carbon mm -hmm. credits is a completely different mm -hmm. discussion or, the, or renewable yeah. energy credits. So right. could, could you explain a little bit more about the, the corporate PPAs, please? Oh, sure. Yeah, so one of the key remaining demands in Asia is really enabling transparent, market-driven renewable electricity transactions between buyers and sellers, which inevitably drive us the topic of implementing the corporate power purchase agreements. And as I briefly explained earlier, PPAs are long-term deals between electricity producers and corporate consumers, enabling buyers to purchase renewable electricity at a fixed price for long term. So there are like many, many benefits of this mechanism, like consumers can secure and guarantee renewable energy at competitive rates, while it supports the development of new renewable energy projects for developers. So that is why it is currently recognized by corporates as to be one of the most effective mechanisms. But we have very limited opportunities in Southeast Asia with having only Singapore where CPPAs are being available, whereas others not yet. So in many of Southeast Asia countries, we're really trying to prioritize our key policy asks around the implementation of the PPA mechanisms. And as governments are playing a vital role here, we are trying to accelerate our advocacy work to support or sometimes to push the government to implement such mechanism by introducing new laws and easing regulations. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good segue for kind of like my next question, which is on a kind of procedural basis, how does ASEC actually work? Yeah, thank you, Joseph, for the question. I actually have a lot to talk about, given very hard efforts we have been putting in since last year. So I will try to be concise, uh, but if not, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. ASEC's work primarily involves crafting sophisticated narratives and thought leadership pieces based on the policy priorities identified by our members uh, through specific prioritization exercises. And we use these tools to engage with policymakers to ask for creating a more favorable environment for renewable energy investments with proven data and analysis. And these are executed through the two different levels of the programs. There are country programs which fit into our regional programs, and these programs are embraced by what we call a policy hub of ASEC. And through this policy hub, 
we provided the key policy and market trends in five of our priority markets, which are Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Singapore, and Vietnam. At the moment, we are able to reassess the priority markets every two years. So there is a possibility that we, we might be adding some countries in Asia or dropping off some depending on our strategy. And we're trying to summarize this policy and market trends in the form of market intelligence summary newsletter. I know mm. that like so many different kinds of newsletters bombarding our mailbox literally these days, but yeah. we're really trying to differentiate this by specifically focusing on the corporate renewable electricity procurement related policy trends and corporate driven initiatives. So now I would like to take more time to touch a little bit more of what we do around each of our five priority markets. That would be great. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So starting with Indonesia, we are currently developing a thought leadership piece to assess corporate renewable energy options, aiming to influence the expansion of the options by engaging with the new administration to come this year. Because at the current stage in Indonesia, we don't have uh, many options available in the market. We only have unbundled RECs and also rooftop solar development available for the corporates at the moment. And in Japan, we started working to improve the regulatory environment, particularly in zoning for offshore wind and streamlining permitting processes while also we are trying to address the balance of renewable energy prices. In Korea, we prioritize unlocking renewable energy potential specifically in wind and solar, including permitting and siding issues, which are kind of similar to the issues we are dealing in Japan. And also, we are trying to work around enhancement of green premium program and PPAs. So we just held B2G sharing session on green premium topic in Korea with Korea Energy Agency, together with the climate group and the local partners like SFOC and COSIF just last month in Korea in person. And we are also collaborating with SEMI to bring the semiconductor voices into our quantification exercise around the renewable energy demand and investment. And with this paper, we are really trying to demonstrate what level of renewable energies can be developed once key policy bottlenecks are resolved. In Vietnam, yes. a part of this purchase agreement in our policy agenda. Uh, we just held a very productive workshop last week in Hanoi in person, where we brought all different levels of stakeholders, ecosystem partners, and our members to have an alignment on key policy messages. And direct power purchase agreements was identified as a top priority. And as a next step, we will arrange a high-level roundtable session where we will be inviting C-suite levels from our members together with minister-level policymakers to have a discussion about our key policy asks. In Singapore, we are convened under the regional working group of ASEC as us being a regional platform. We are concentrating on regional topics that align with the broader goals of ASEC, such as ASEAN power grid interconnectivity and cross-border clean energy trading issue. So what about these two topics? So for the ASEAN power grid interconnectivity, the so-called APG, the coalition recognizes the critical role of regional power system integration in creating an enabling environment for economic growth and also for decarbonization. So ASEC is actively engaging with industry, investors, and government to advance practical and financial ideas 
on the APG. And we are also trying to emphasize the benefits of increased regional interconnections for clean energy penetration. And also we are trying to bring private sector perspectives here. We have a very well-written paper around this APG topic. You can find it on our website. And I would highly suggest all of you to read it because it will um, summarize what kind of voices we are trying to make as private sector and what we are really what what is the really goal we are trying to achieve through this ASEAN power grid interconnectivity. Moving on to cross-border clean energy trading issue. It is very critical issue for the countries that need to be highly relied on clean electricity import uh, due to limited domestic generation opportunity like Singapore. However, under the current GHG protocol or RE100 reporting frameworks, ASEAN is not considered as a single market, which means that consumers of this cross-border traded clean energy cannot make claims as being legitimate for the current existing reporting framework requirements, like once guided in GH2 protocol and CDP technical guidelines. So the shared issue of interest right now is really to understand what is needed in practice to ensure there is physical delivery of power, which is linked to our APG topic, a consistent means of tracking and retiring wrecks that are being traded across different countries, and also a regulatory alignment on labeling and claiming the source of renewable energy that is being traded across different borders. So ASEC seeks to play a role as convener to engage and work with CDP, R100, GHG protocol, which is under the work of WRI, to really investigate what is required to facilitate cross-border transactions in line with reporting framework requirements that corporate needs to adhere with. So these are the two main regional level topics that we are working around, uh, which are fed by the country level activities and topics that we are dealing with our five priority markets. So it, it sounds to me, Suji, that, I mean, mm -hmm. it's extremely complicated and obviously an enormous amount of work because, number one, you've got this kind of Asian mandate across Asia with the priorities, and then you also got the kind of individual country discussions and you're, I know you organized, you told me before, uh, you know, roundtables, public-private roundtables as well. Right. So it's, it's all incredibly complex. But uh, in my personal experience, there's something which is important, which is the capacity building, because you'll find mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. regions, in my personal experience, right, in some jurisdictions right, right. like Singapore and, and Korea, they're actually mm -hmm. really, really on top of all of the different clean energy issues, but in some other countries, and I will mention the names, you don't have to, but in some other countries like Indonesia, to some extent Philippines, and, and even to, to some extent Japan, they're not kind of familiar with the overall ecosystem. So is that, uh, two, two questions on that statement, is, is, is that an issue? And, you know, obviously I'm not sure if you have enough capacity for capacity building, given you're already doing so many things. So mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, I, I actually, I'm actually glad that you brought that up. Well, although ASEC is not like a capacity building focused platform, we are more like a policy advocacy uh, focused platform. We are trying to collaborate with uh, different partners and organizations on this capacity building component because it automatically brings us to the supply chain engagement angle. So we have like a lot of small to medium sized companies which are seen as very important in the supply chain angle and we are trying to engage as many of them as possible to bring more added value to our collective voice for policy advocacy efforts. 
uh, while we're we'll really trying to engage them into this advocacy efforts, I really think it's important to highlight the capacity building component for those SMEs, small to medium enterprises, mm-hmm. because oftentimes they're, I, I've witnessed that they're led in their internal capacity to deal with this sustainability agenda, since yes. this agenda is relatively very new concept here. I mean, what, mm-hmm. it has been only two years, three years so far that all these renewable energy procurement options available for corporates are introduced to the markets in Asia. So mm-hmm. many of these SMEs are not very familiar with these options, mm-hmm. despite of this growing pressure from their customers to be part of the journey. So I think prior to our efforts to engage them into our policy advocacy efforts, I, I think the capacity building components is really important part that we need to expand on as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I 120% agree with what with what you said in, in, in terms of my own personal experience, especially with uh, small to medium enterprises, because they're, yes. I mean, they're small, so they mm-hmm. have their resources, they have limited resources as opposed yes. to a huge company. And on top of it, some of them may not actually fully understand why they really need to do all of that. Exactly. Uh, they they oftentimes they see it as cost, not investment. Yes. Yes. Mm. And so ex- mm-hmm. explaining the kind of what kind of returns can you have from being more sustainable is is quite a key topic. And just to put a little bit of color on you know examples or an example or two of clean energy procurement. Do, do you have any examples on that? Based on like very specific case, right? Yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah, let me, okay. <laughs> let me introduce just like one case which we officially made a comment on, uh, which is Amazon's case uh, last year in December. So. Amazon invested in a 60 megawatt solar park in South Korea, really exemplifies successful corporate renewable energy procurement, showcasing the potential for clean energy projects to support global operations with 100% renewable energy. So this was really a great case, which we made an official comment on. And I know that there are like so many wonderful stories and cases out there with our members, but I just would like to, yeah, bring up this case as we, as this is the one, the most recently we made a comment on. Sure, sure. No, that's great. That's great. That's great. Just moving up a gear a little bit. If you, if somebody were to ask you, but by 2050 Mm -hmm. is corporate clean energy procurement in Asia going to be a thing or uh, we will still be struggling and facing the, the various challenges? I mean, how how do you see the kind of long-term future over the next 25 years? Uh, I really hope that we, well, we should not be struggling by 2050. I see, well, I see progress looks promising, but more is needed, definitely. Like, as we know, considerable decarbonization opportunity remains in APEC, but it is still challenging due to the aforementioned issues like limited availability, greater capacity constraints, and very high level of regulatory complexity. So I really think that creating the enabling conditions for quickly scaling corporate investments in new uh, renewable projects would greatly help to accelerate progress towards this 2030 goal, uh, where we believe governments are playing a key role in introducing new laws and easing regulations to the renewable electricity procurement options. So I think we really have to work together with the governments to pave our way for a sustainable energy future in the region. 
No, that's that, that, that's great. And, and I guess one, one thing I want to emphasize from my side is that mm-hmm. another kind of positive uh, trend is the mm-hmm. fact that governments are willing to talk. So we're not in a situation where they're saying, no, nah, we're not interested. Right. Yeah, we'll get to renewables, but, you know, it's it's slow and we've got challenges and we've got limitations. Mm-hmm. There is actually there are actually different platforms, as you mentioned earlier, some of the countries mm-hmm. that you mentioned, like in Indonesia, Singapore, etc., where they're willing to sit right. down with the right. private sector and say, well, OK, this is the challenges. What right. can we do? It. That 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 That's I think right. is a very positive positive trend. That's right. And about yeah, for that I actually have very one small comment. Well, for some governments are relatively advancing adoption of the mechanisms, while others not yet. But yes, we see positive signals as governments are trying to listen to us, listen to our corporate voices, where the challenges are and how we can work together and how we can actually help them uh, to solve these problems. So as ASAC, we're actually, what, what we are actually trying to do here as us to be a regional platform is to create this race to the top type of very virtuous competition Mm -hmm. among the countries in Asia by sharing and comparing different level of efforts being done around the corporate decarbonization in each of these countries. So Mm -hmm. I hope that we can successfully create this kind of very healthy competition among the countries while we also provide them the opportunities to uh, learn from each other. That's great. And be, be, just before we wrap it up, Suji, because I've already taken too much of your time. You know, be, <laughs> no worries. So, do you have any, like, any any conclusions or any key takeaways? Yeah, well, as I am keep, keep emphasizing, the potential for corporate investment in renewable electricity is huge in Asia. But with an increasing the number of companies basing investment and supply chain decisions on their ability to source renewable electricity, there is also a big economic risk for countries that fail to secure this investment and accelerate their renewable energy transition. So governments in Asia should definitely capitalize on the clean energy demand and provide a momentum by creating supportive policy frameworks and environments for corporate procurement of renewable electricity. I believe that we definitely should continue our collaboration between private and public sectors to overcome the current challenges and again to pave the way for a sustainable energy future in this region in Asia. That's my last words. That's great. I overly emphasize the importance of your work. Suji, thank, thank you very, very much for today. And uh, I really appreciate the time. And, and again, uh, keep, keep, keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you so much, Joseph. Yes, I will be highly looking forward to follow up, uh, maybe on capacity building angle as well. And thank you. So thank you again for inviting me to this very exciting episode. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Asia Climate Finance Podcast. Please note that the Asia Climate Finance Podcast is presented for educational purposes only. All information in the podcast must not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. Also please note that the views and opinions expressed by our guests are personal and may not represent the views and opinions of current or previous employers.